So the question says, if the integral from 0 to 1 of x cubed dx is 1 fourth, find the following. Okay, so the first thing they ask us to find is the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x cubed dx. This is actually a really easy problem, but you have to understand what it's asking. Okay? So what I'd like you to do real quick is I'd like you to sketch a picture that represents my given. Here's my given. Can you draw this? You know, what it means. What did, would it look like graphically? Okay, so hopefully you do something like this. You've got the sine, you've got the uh, x cubed graph, right? And then between 0 and 1, you shade in that little area, and evidently that's 1 fourth. That's actually given to us. We'll talk about later why that's true. Why is it 1 fourth, not 1 fifth, you know? So we'll talk about that later, but assuming that that's 1 fourth, how would you answer the question? So let's take a look at the graph between negative 1 and 1 now. So let's go ahead and sketch a picture for this drawing, for this question, I mean. Now we're going from negative 1 to positive 1, which gives us two areas, one here and one here. Okay, now the cubic, x cubed, is an odd function, right? So it has perfect symmetry on the origin. So we would expect that these blue and this blue and red regions have equal and opposite areas, right? So if the red area is 1 fourth, we can assume that the blue area is what? Negative 1 fourth. Negative 1 fourth, right? So this has area negative 1 fourth. This has area positive 1 fourth. So the total area is what? Zero. Okay? So you can just think of it as negative one-fourth on the left, positive one-fourth on the right, cancels out. Okay, so we are assuming one thing. We're assuming that x cubed is odd and that it has this beautiful symmetry. But that's already true anyway. You proved it back in pre-cal. Okay, now the next question says to go from 2 to 3 of x minus 2 cubed dx. Let's try to draw a picture for this also. So what happens to a graph x cubed when we write it as x minus 2 cubed. What just happened to the graph? Shifted, right. Shifted which way? Right. Rightward by two spaces. So let's see what that would look like. Let's see, it'd be the cubic graph, but now it's over here. It's supposed to look flat in the middle. There it is, right? Shift it over to And we're trying to evaluate the area between 2 and 3. That's what it says right here, 2 and 3. Isn't that just this area again? What was that area before we moved the function? 1 fourth. What's the area now that we've moved the function? 1 fourth. Okay. So the answer to this problem is still 1 fourth. So right shifting a graph is not going to affect the area between the curvy x-axis if you go ahead and update the integral. So this teaches us something. This teaches us that if you're ever given an integral, let's say from 2 to 3, you could technically change this question right back into this one. You could take away 2, you could subtract 2 here, subtract 2 here, and add 2 here, and take you right back to this question. You did this with sigmas when you adjusted your index, and you can do it with integrals as well. Okay, hopefully you can see why that's still one fourth. All right, let's take a look at the next question. Next one says integral from zero to one, one minus x cubed dx. Okay, so you might want to write this to help you understand it better. You might want to write it as negative x cubed plus one. Right? 
What happens to a function when you multiply it by negative? Flips it, right? And then what does that plus 1 do? So yeah, this flips over the x-axis. What does the plus 1 do? Shift. Notice we're not adding to the x, right? So it's not a left or right shift. It's an upshift one. So shift up 1. OK, so we could draw a picture of this as well. Imagine taking x cubed, flipping it over, sliding it up a space. So now it's up here. that this is y equals x um, negative x cubed plus 1 we're looking at this graph that I just boxed okay so what happened to my little red area well my little red area was originally here when we started and then when we flipped it over, ended up down here. See? And then when we slid this thing upward, it ended up right here. See? This is where it all, this is where it kind of ended up. The little red area. But we are looking for the integral which means we're trying to find this purple area in here. That's what it means to find a definite integral. Find the area between the curve and the x-axis. So we're not interested in the red, we're interested in that purple. But what is the area of this box right here in blue? What's the area of that little box? The area of the blue box is 1. Let me show you why. So the, the original function, x cubed, passes through 0, 0, and 1, 1. Right? When we flipped it upside down, it looked like this. Passing through 0, 0, and 1, negative 1, like that. And then we shifted it up. This point right here is the point one zero. I'm back over here in my drawing, my box. This is the point one zero, and this is the point zero one. So this is just a little one by one box. And we've already taken, we've already talked about the uh, upper right corner. It's one fourth area. So what's the purple area then? Three fourths. is 3 fourths because the area of that little box is 1 and the blue port the uh, red portion is area 1 fourth so the rest of it has to be 3 fourths so I'll just color code it the calculations are 1 minus oh no let's do that in blue so 1 is the area of the box minus and then the take out the red area which is 1 fourth and that gives you the purple area 3 fourths okay so that's how that would work. Interesting question. All right, let's look at uh, part D. Is this new for everybody? Has anyone ever done this before? Oh, yeah, right, he has, yeah. But uh, this is pretty new, isn't it? Kind of neat. We're learning something completely new. Um, let's go ahead and look at D. It says 0 to 1, x cubed plus 3. Okay, so what does adding 3 to a function do? Shift up 3, right. So let's just draw a picture of this. Here's your original function, right? And this area was 1 fourth. And remember, this is the point 1, 1, right? We're now shifting straight up by 3 spaces. Okay, so let's put the phones away here. So we're going to shift straight up by three spaces. Now we're up at one, two, three, and it goes like that. 
And now this is the point, not 1, 1, but 1, 4. And that point that was at the origin is now at 0, 3. The, the little red area has shifted up to here now. But we're looking for the integral. The integral is all of this area in purple. Right? Okay, so this time we're going to be looking at the fact that an extra rectangle of area has shown up. And that's a little 1 by 3 rectangle, you see. So we have this 1 by 3 rectangle that formed underneath the red area when we shift it up. So we get a 3 by 1 rectangle plus that 1 fourth for a total of 3 and 1 fourth. So total area is 13 fourths. Okay, and I'll just show my work by color coding. The area of that box was 3, and then I added on the red 1 fourth <coughs> to get my answer. So my answer is 13 fourths. Okay, now I'd like to show you a totally different way of looking at this problem. Okay, we said that you can also take a problem like this one where it says x cubed plus 3 on the integrand, and you can break it into two separate problems. How about writing it as the integral from 0 to 1 of x cubed dx plus the integral from 0 to 1 of 3 dx. So take the sum of the integral, because there's two terms there. This was given 1 fourth. So I'll write that in red. This was given, right? Uh, this other one we talked about, as long as this is a constant, right, you can just do basically C times B minus A. Remember that little rule we learned on Monday, little trick. So in this problem, C times B minus A would be 3 times 1 minus 0. So this gives you 13 fourths as well, just a different way of looking at it. Okay, um, part C that we did a few minutes ago, that one also could be done by splitting it up into two problems. Maybe you should go back uh, later tonight and look at part C and, and break it into two integrals and try it that way. Okay, and let's look at uh, E. E says 0 to 1 of x cubed minus 1. See, on this one, I'm not going to draw a picture. Recall from part C that the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus x cubed was 3 fourths. Remember that? Look back at your answer for part C. Isn't this problem just the opposite of that? Right? This problem is asking us for x cubed minus 1. But if you take a negative out, you could write the question Here's the question. You could write the question like this, just pointing out the negative. In fact, that negative, we said, the negative can pop all the way out of the integral. Integrals are just limits, is all they are. So you could pull a negative out all the way to the very, very front. I like to call it the front front. And we already answered this part earlier. This part was 3 fourths. So I'm just going to really cheat my way through that one and borrow my answer from C. It's just the opposite of that. That way I don't have to draw a picture. Okay, what about part F? So what, what sets part F apart from the others? Like why does this one look, like what makes this one so different from the other five questions I gave you? Yeah, it looks like we're dealing with an entirely new function here, right? Now we're talking about cube root of x. That's a brand new graph. But what is the relationship between cube root of x and x cubed? What, what relationship do they share? Isn't this the inverse function? OK, so 
if x cubed looks like this and passes through 0, 0, and 1, 1, this is y equals x cubed, we know that y equals q root of x just looks like this. Okay, so that red area that we were dealing with that was given to us is over here now. See? So this is a uh, reflection over the y equals x line. I saw some of you kind of flipping your hand like that. So once it's inverted, the red area just hops over to the other side and becomes between the y-axis and the curve. Okay, so this question is not really that hard to answer. Um, we still have to keep in mind what's being asked, but here is a picture of what we know. We know the graph looks like this, because that's the cube root graph. We know that this area right here is one fourth. That's between zero and one on the y-axis. But we are still asked for this area between zero and one on the x-axis. We're still interested in the purple because it's an integral. So we're interested in the purple area. What is it? It's three-fourths again. The uh, box here is a one by one square, right? So one minus the one-fourth. We did that earlier. That's the three-fourths. OK? All right, so one thing still remains. Like, why is that red area one-fourth in the first place? That was just given to us. We will not talk about that today. We'll talk about that um, starting tomorrow, actually. OK? So that was like kind of not follow the bouncing red ball, but follow the bouncing red area. The air, little area was jumping all over the place, and we tried to keep track of it. So we were able to find areas under the curve using it. Let's look at example two. So the givens on this problem, there are three of them. It says that the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x is 2. And the integral from 1 to 5 of f of x is negative 5. And the integral from negative 1 to 1 of g of x is 8. So I would like to draw a picture of this, if I can. My first two givens refer to the function f, right? They both have the same integrand. See? This is f of x, this is f of x. So what we can do is just draw one picture for that first, those first two givens. So let's just draw a quick picture. I'd like to design it where if you go from negative 1 to 1, the area is somehow positive 2. So I was thinking we could just maybe sketch something like this and just put like a 2 in there. I don't know exactly what the function looks like. I just know that the area there is 2. So this is my choice drawing. OK? And then if I go from 1 to 5, according to the second given, the area from 1 to 5 is negative 5. What does that mean for the area to be negative 5? What does that mean? Below the x-axis. Below the x-axis. Right. And a full 5 units of area. So. It needs to have kind of twice the area that that purple piece had. All right, so let's go ahead and draw the second part of this. Maybe something like that. Negative 5. Okay, I like to draw the area right on the space, you know? So I put a negative 5 2 right there, meaning the area is 2. I put a negative 5 there. I don't think AP graders do that, but that's what I do. Yeah? Are there any, like, integrals with functions that aren't continuous and, like, differential like that? Oh, you mean, is that, I could have made this like a vertical tangent right here? At x equals 1, right? Um, yeah, I think you could still have a vertical tangent there. Like, this could be even a semicircle with, with area 2. That's possible. And then coming out of here, this could be a semicircle or something. Or maybe like part of an ellipse, probably. Yeah, I don't think it has to be fully differentiable um, for the areas to add up well. But you don't want to have, like, asymptotes and things, because then we have to do something else. We have to use limits to solve those. We will be running into weird problems where you have to integrate right through an asymptote. But that's not until chapter uh, 
eight. Yeah. But anyway, this is my little drawing. And you do not have to draw what I drew. If you want, you can make this purple part more triangular and the green part more triangular. It doesn't matter. As long as we all agree that the area in this space is 2 and the area in this space is negative 5. Is everyone with me? All right. OK, so the second drawing is for this third given. And the third given says that the area between negative 1 and 1 for g is 8. So for that one, you could draw something like this. Just maybe like a little bump here and put 8 right there. Or it doesn't really even say that it has x-intercepts at negative 1 and 1. You could draw this if you want. Just draw something like this, a random curve. And this area is 8 in here. It doesn't really matter so much. This is the only interval they gave us from negative 1 to 1. So it's not like I have to add to this picture. I'm done. OK, I'm going to go with my first drawing there just because, I don't know, it's just I feel like it. Okay? But you can use that second picture if you prefer. But this is the function g. So this is g of x. And this is f of x. OK, now let's see if we can use our pictures to kind of get through the math here. So for part a, the question asks, what is the integral from 5 to 1 of f of x dx? Well, you'll notice that the larger number is at the bottom. What happens when we do that? What happens if we switch the 1 and the 5? It negates the result, right? So we'll just put a negative there, and then we could freely switch the 1 and the 5. So I just rewrote the question. And then I've already been given that this part was 2. That was given. I'm sorry, uh, negative 5. It's up above. So this is green, yeah. Negative 5. OK, so this gives me basically negative of negative 5. So the answer is 5. Let's look at part B. What is the area between negative 1 and positive 5 for f of x? Well, I'm glad I drew this picture because you can see that there's a positive area in purple and a negative area in green. And those are being combined going all the way from negative 1 to 5, see? So as we go all the way across, we end up getting 2 units square units of area here and negative 5 there, so it comes out to negative 3. It's basically just 2 plus that negative 5, negative 3. That's the net area. Uh, let's look at part C. Part C asks us for integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x plus g of x dx. And we had said that we can split an integral of a sum into a sum of integrals. So why don't we do that? Let's write this as the integral from negative 1 to 1 of f of x dx plus the integral from negative 1 to 1 of g of x dx, both of which are given. So this first one is just neg uh, it's just a 2, not negative 2, just 2. And the second one is simply what? 8. So the answer is 10, 10. Just 2 and 8. All right, let's go and look at uh, D now. D is the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx. OK, on this one, there's a little bit of a temptation here. We're trying to go from 0 to 1. And the temptation is to think that because the area from negative 1 to 1 was 2 square units, that if you go just from 0 to 1, it'll be half of that. It's not true. Okay, when I drew this, I was fully aware that this is not the only drawing that could exist. It is possible that this area that straddles the y-axis is not symmetric to the y-axis. So when I originally drew this, I was well aware that I might need to come back and kind of resketch it. What if it had been like this? 
where this side is like 1.5 in its area, and this is just 0.5. And the sum is 2, but there's no reason to think that from 0 to 1, half of that area occurred. So I do not believe that this has to be half of the total area. This picture kind of disproves that. So I'm going to put not enough information for part D. Not enough info. And for part E, the instructions, remember, told us that G of X had eight square units of area here, if you're going from negative one to one. They would like us to study between negative two and two on G of X. Um, and we can't do that because we don't have any information about G of X outside this interval negative one to one. So this problem also is not enough information. How can you predict what the area will be outside this region? You don't even have a graph. You don't have any other givens. Not enough info for parts D and E. Okay? All right, so there's certain things you can assume and certain things you cannot assume. You cannot assume a function is symmetric on the y-axis. You cannot assume that this graph is, you know, periodic, and, and you can't assume that it's going to suddenly go like this, you know, and then this will be negative 8 or something. None of that. You cannot assume anything outside the given stuff unless it happens to be an even function or something. All right? So we're going to stop there today because uh, that is actually the end of our time. And then we'll continue on tomorrow. We'll talk about that maximum inequality, average value of a function, and how to use an antiderivative. Let's talk about the max-min inequality. Okay, this is really simple to understand. Let's say you have a function, and it goes between A and B. So something like this. Maybe try to draw what I drew, because for this example, I want it to go down first, and then up again, and then back down. Okay, so this is at A, and this is at B. And let's say that you were very interested in finding the area under this curve. Like that, okay. You want to know this area. But you don't know, you don't really know how. Well, you can definitely make an estimate. You can use LRAM, RRAM, MRAM, all that good stuff, right? You can use that new button, um, Math9. That's awesome. That thing's really accurate. Um, but another thing you can just say about this very holistically is the area that you see in black is most definitely larger than the area of this rectangle right here. Would you agree? The area is definitely bigger or more than the area of that rectangle. Everyone agree with that? That rectangle has smaller area than the black. And also, if you construct a rectangle that reaches to the highest point on the function, this big red one, you can certainly say that the black area is less than the area of the red rectangle. You guys agree with that? Okay, so what we're saying is that black area is between, something between those two red, uh, the two colored boxes. Okay, let's talk about the area of the green box. Okay, the area of the green box is length times width. So what is the length from here to here? What is it? You're talking about, no, I was talking about the green rectangle, just how wide it is. But I know for, but for the bigger rectangle, why is the height go above the function if f of b is? Oh, I tried to make it touch the very topmost point on this function, okay. which is not the right end point. The, the right end point's at b, but it looks like this graph achieved its maximum just before you got to b. Okay. okay. But how wide is this rectangle, with this green one here? B minus A, someone whispered. Thank you. Okay, how tall is this rectangle? Well, it looks like I've kind of graphed this 
green rectangle such that the bottom of the function touches it. So this distance right here, we would call this the minimum value of f. So the function f is right here, this curve, and it reached its minimum not too far into the journey, right? So we're just going to call this distance min f, the minimum value of f. I don't really know what it is. Maybe it's 1 or something. Okay. Now let's look at the red box. How white is it? Come on, guys. How white is the red box? B minus, B minus a again. What's the actual height of this, this red box? Let's call it max f. Okay? So if we wanted to write this down, what we're trying to say, we would say this, that the true area in black, that's called the integral from a to b of f of x dx, this area falls between min f times b minus a, which is just the area of the green rectangle, and max f times b minus a. So that's not really that hard to understand. It's, we're just saying basically that that black area falls between the area of the two colored rectangles. Any questions on that? OK. So a simple idea. You might even wonder why would we even bother doing that? Well, there's good reasons for it. We'll get to them later. OK, let's do an example now. So how would you use this in a problem? Well, this problem says, show that. This is our next example. Show that the integral from 5 to 8 of the square root of x plus 4 dx lies between 9 and 6 rad 3. Okay? All right, so what I'm going to do is write down the max min inequality. The max min inequality was this min f times b minus a is less than or equal to the integral right which in turn is less than max f times b minus a well what are a and b for this problem no no a and b are the limits of integration look at the integral in the middle Aren't they just 5 and 8? OK. So this is just min of f, 8 minus 5, is less than or equal to the integral from 5 to 8, square root of x plus 4 dx, is less than or equal to, and then max of f times 8 minus 5. <coughs> OK, what is the minimum value of f? Let's talk about that for a minute. Maybe a sketch would help here. So this is actually a really simple graph. This is just the square root function shifted to the left floor. So everybody should know that. This is our graph. OK? And we're studying the region out here between 5 and 8. So 5 is right here. 8 is right here. We're only interested in this region. I'll color it in green. Okay? What is the minimum value of this function on this interval from 5 to 8? Well, this thing is rising the entire time. So I think the minimum value of this function in this little interval is f of 5. And then the maximum is over here at f of 8. It's higher up, see? So min is just simply square root of 5 plus 4, and this is, of course, just 3. And then the max value is the square root of 8 plus 4 times that 3 there. And we've done did it. They asked us to show that this was between 9 and 6 root 3, and we just did. So the answer is... 9 is less than or equal to our integral, which is
which in turn is less than or equal to, and it's square root, it's 3 root 12, but that's the same thing as 6 root 3. So, so we done did it. You can do the same thing in the homework when I assign a problem just like this. Okay? I did not write the assignment on the board because I still want to handpick my problems and make sure that I don't give you anything beyond what I taught you today. And my clock is wrong, by the way, on the wall. It's 122 right now. You were wondering. You must have been thinking you were bored because time goes slow when you're bored. Okay. Yes. All right, so that's, a, that's an important rule. All right, but this next rule is much more important than that. The average value of a function. This has to be one of the most one of the most interesting theorems in, of the school year. Okay, I think you'll appreciate it. Okay, let's say I gave you the task of averaging um, the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. What is the average? How would you find the average? I'll, I'll do this graph in a minute. I just want you to average these numbers together. What's well, 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5? 15. And there are six numbers here, right? So this actually comes out to 2 and a half, right? What if I asked you to average 0, 0 0.5, 1.0, 1.5, 2.0, 2.5, 3.0, 3.5, 4.0, 4.5, and 5.0? 42. 42. <laughs> You know, you can do it, um, you know, you can add like the first and last number. Yeah. So what's 0 plus 5? Five? Five. 5. What's 0.5 plus 4.5? 5. Five. 5. So, so far we're up to 10. Here's another 5 here. 15. Here's another 5. 20. 25. 27.5. And how many we got here? 11. 2.5. Okay, so let me ask you this. What if I had you do every point 0.1? You know, like 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, all the way up to 5.0. And you average all of them. You think you'd still get 2.5? Yes, you would. You'd have a different sum and a different total numbers of numbers, and it would still come out to 2.5. What happens if I ask you to average every real number? between 0 and 5? All of them? 2.5. 2.5. But how do you explain that? Like, how do you average all the real numbers between 0 and 5? Do you just add them all up and divide by how many there are? What is the sum of all the numbers between 0 and 5? And I mean all of them. Infinity. Right? If you add 0 0.0000001 and 0 0.0000002 and so forth, you add that up, you're going to get a pretty big number, right? It, it would take you your whole life to do all infinite numbers between 0 and 5. There's so many of them. You never run out of them, right? And then how do you divide by the amount that you added if you really just added an infinite number of numbers? Okay, so... Another way of asking this is, what is the average value of this function? This is the y equals x line graphed between 0 and 5. Okay? If I asked you to add up and average all of the y coordinates on this line, every possible y coordinate, add them together and divide by how many there are, that question is just mind boggling. Like, how would you do that? But we would still expect the answer to be 2.5. Okay? Okay, so calculus actually has a way of doing this. In place of adding up all the numbers, we will do an integral from 0 to 5. Uh, where the function is simply x. 
in this case. So this is just x. And then you would divide by the interval. So this is the integral, and this is the interval. Okay? And this is the formula you see at the top of the page. So let's try it real quick. The integral just represents this area. This is a 5 by 5 right triangle. So what is the area of a 5 by 5 right triangle? One half of base times height, right? So 25 halves, okay? So this would just give us 25 halves. And then if you divide by the interval, that's just 5 minus 0. That's how wide the interval is. You get 5 halves, 2.5. Okay, so what we just did was we magically added up all the numbers between 0 and 5. And I mean all of them, including pi and all of those guys. Then we divided by how many there were. And I don't feel like we really did that, but we did. So the area of this divided by the width gives us the average value here. Okay, now what's really cool about this is it works on any function, as long as there's an integral as long as you can find the integral. So let's take a look at example one. Let's find the average of sine x on the interval from 0 to pi. OK? And we're going to use the formula that you have your notes there. I'll copy it down for those watching the video. So av f equals integral. over interval. Really easy to remember. Integral over interval. Okay, so we're going to be doing integral from 0 to pi of sine x dx all over pi minus 0. This will give you the average value of sine x on the interval 0 to pi. Okay, we don't necessarily know how to find the top integral yet. But we have a calculator that knows how to do it. You could type this into your calculator. It's going to find the area under the first bump of a sine wave. Or you can refer back to the video. Do you remember what it was? It was 2. It was 2. I had to send out a correction on that. So this is a 2 is the area. Your calculator can give you that also. Your calculator can give you that 2. All right? And uh, this is just pi. What is 2 over pi? Let's check on our calculator. What is 2 over pi? Yeah, good. Good estimating. It's, I think it's 0.636. I'm just going to double check here because I want to prove a point or make a, make a statement about it. It's 0.6366 or something like that. So what does this mean? Like, what does this actually mean? Let me explain it. So we know that the sine wave, as you travel from 0 to pi, right? Don't miss this. It takes on all sorts of different y values, right? Of course, all of them are between 0 and 1. On average, if you averaged all of those y values together, what would you get? You would get 0.6366 if you could average all of them together. And this is how you do it, integral over interval. OK, so what I'd like to do is, as you do an example like this in your homework tonight, OK, after you get your average, put a point or points down where you think that average is. OK, or you could draw a line like this if you want. But the, the reason I drew these is because there, there are a lot of points in here, and they all have different y's, you know. But these two are special because they have the average value. You know, it's like when a teacher gives a test and everyone gets a different score. And then the teacher finds a class average is 76 or something. And there's actually a kid in the room who got 76. They actually hit the average mark. These two points are special. They are the only two points that actually have the average y value. Some of the other points are above average and some are below average. Does that make sense?
make sense? Okay. So here's the really mind-boggling part. What I just drew, that little green line, don't miss this, I know some of you are goofing around on your phones. If you draw a rectangle right here, what do you suppose the area of that thing is? The same area. The same area as what? That's right. This green area, this box, has the same area as the sine wave bump. That's pretty cool. I think that's a really cool theorem. So here's what we are saying. We're saying that there are many y values. We can find the average of all of them very easily just doing integral or interval. Calculate all this out of it. 0.6366 is a magic number. They represent the average of all possible y values. There are two points that share it. If you construct a rectangle right here, the area of that green rectangle is the black area. Very interesting. Let's try another example. What is the average value of 4x minus x squared on the interval 1 to 3? Well, it's going to be the integral from 1 to 3 of 4x minus x squared all over 3 minus 1. See? Might need a little help with the calculator from the calculator on this integral until we learn to do it by hand. So you can use your math 9 button for that. And I think I remember the answer, but I just want to type it in just in case. It's 7.3 repeating, okay, over 2. I'm just going to interpret that as 7 and 1 third over 2. In other words, 22 thirds over 2. In other words, 11 thirds. Okay, so I believe that this is 11 thirds, in other words, 3.6 repeating. Okay, so the average value in exact form is 11 thirds. The average value in approximate form is uh, 3.6. Everyone with me? Let's draw a sketch of what it means. So... 4x minus x squared is the function. I always like to factor these things if I can. Um, this factors into x times 4 minus x. This helps me sort of understand that the roots are at 0 and 4. And we also know that this is a parabola that opens down. So it's probably going to look something like this. And we're very interested in the interval between 1 and 3. So it's like I'm giving this parabola hair. There we go. Uh, I was only supposed to go from 1 to 3. I went a little bit on 3 there. Anyway, this is supposed to look like that. There we go. Everyone with me? Okay. So there are several y values in here. Um, the y values actually range between 3 and 4. Um, this is 3 right here on the y-axis, and this is 4 up here. This is the point 2, 4 at the top. And there are many y-values in that region, but the average of all of them is 3.6666666. And there are two points in there that have that y-value, 3.6666666. Only two points qualified to have the average there. If you draw a box... Uh, we're only going to go from 1 to 3. Okay, so if you draw a box from 1 to 3, I don't know, it's not very good. I'm going to move my 3 over here a bit. This is 3. If in doubt, make it bigger. There we go. If you draw a box that passes through the average for the interval 1 to 3, that box right there has the same area as the parabola has. So I'm going to draw just a quick sketch of this, a little bit improved sketch. The crown of this parabola looks like that. Okay. The uh, average, this is the point one three. This is the point two four. 
and this is the point 3, 3, okay? And the area here matches the area of this rectangle, and the, the area of this rectangle is, of course, the same base as the, the uh, 1 to 3. It's still 2 this way. But this height is the 3.6. The average value of the function is the height of that rectangle. Pretty cool. Pretty cool theorem. OK, let's try this one. Why don't you guys try this one here? I'll give you a few minutes to try it out. Don't be intimidated by the t. You can change it to an x if you like. I actually drew the graph for you because I wasn't sure if you would know that this is a unit circle shifted, uh, an upside down unit circle shifted up three spaces. So, was this one on the homework? I might have gotten this one from the book. I think I modified one of the problems in the book. That's what I did. Okay, there's your function. And there's a lot of y-coordinates in there, but there's an average y-coordinate. integral over interval. Watch out for that interval. You're subtracting 2 minus negative 2. So that's going to be a 4 on the bottom. You can use math 9 to get that top integral. And then just divide by 4. Okay, so how do you know when you're supposed to use your calculator to do the integral? Well, honestly, on this problem, you don't need a calculator. Um, this is a semicircle, so you can interpret it like this. This is like a box. This probably needs to be wider. I need to redraw that. I'm drawing this box right here. This box, I'll draw it over here, has a 4 this way and 3 this way, because this is the point 2, 3, and this is the point negative 2, 3. And there's like a semicircle cut out of it like this. And you're just looking for this area. This is the integral between the curve and the x-axis, right? So you can just think of it as a rectangle of area 12 minus a semicircle of radius 2. So pi 2 squared over 2, all over interval, which is 4. So anyway, it's the answer is actually 12 minus 2 pi all over 4. Or you could put 6 minus pi all over 2. Or you could just run the math 9 on this thing. The decimal is interesting anyway. So you said you got 1.429? Yeah, that's what I got, too. So 1.429. And what I'd ask you to do is to draw where you think those are. So 1.429 would be probably this point has that y-coordinate. And this point has that y-coordinate. I'm not too sure what the x-coordinates are. But I just plotted the two points I believe have 1.429 as their y-coordinate. Now I'm going to construct a little rectangle here that's the same width as the interval. That green box has the same as the black area in the other picture there. So I'm having you draw that because it's preparation for the mean value theorem of integrals, which is the next theorem at the bottom. OK? So I'm just wanting you to sketch that tonight. OK, all of your problems tonight will be um, basically average value problems and maybe a few like the examples we've done. Okay. 
at the beginning of the lesson. And then I want you to go ahead and draw that green rectangle every time you do an average value problem to help us prepare for our minds for tomorrow. What was, the what was the MVT for the derivative? F prime of C. Uh, f of B minus F of A over B minus A. Yeah, okay, listen, guys. I want to explain this in context because I don't want this to feel like a brand new rule and it's totally a different rule from everything you've ever learned, you know. Um, we had learned earlier in the year that if you have two points, right, and you have a nice differentiable graph between A and B. We said that if you take the average, I'm sorry, if you take the, um, the secant line that connects A to B, remember that? We said that if you connect that line, then as long as the curve is nice and continuous, there exists at least one spot on the curve where the tangent line, okay, has the same slope as the secant line. Raise your hand if you remember that. This is the mean value theorem for derivatives. It's just basically that these red lines are parallel to the blue one. And we believe these red lines have to exist, at least one of them. Another way of saying it is there is definitely a spot on the graph, at least one, where the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. Well, in the mean value theorem for integrals, we switch it up a little bit, and it's basically saying this. If the graph between A and B is continuous, okay, then we believe that somewhere on the curve, there is at least one point that lives right on the average value. Okay, so instead of saying there is one line with a slope that's the average of change, we say there is at least one point that lives on the average y-coordinate. Okay? So if you were to do the beans activity with this graph, you'd probably get a rectangle right about in here. And sure enough, there's a point that lives right on the edge of that rectangle. So this is the point C, f of C lives right on the average value. Okay, now in a classroom of 100 students that take a test, let's say the class average is 70. Does that mean, does that mean that there's a student that got 70? Yes. Maybe. You can have a class average of 70 without a single student getting 70. Half the class could get 69, and the other half could, class could get 71, and the class average would be a 70, even though no one actually had that score. Isn't that true? But if I told you that all possible scores were given and distributed, everybody got every possible score, like there's a, at least a student with a 99, and there's at least a student with a 98, and every possible integer score from 0 to 100 was distributed, someone got a 1, someone got a 0, someone got a 5, you would know for sure that at least one kid got that 70. That's what's going on here. We know that this graph is fully connected. We know that there's nothing missed in here. There's no gaps. And we know that the average is whatever, let's say 10. That means one of these points has a y by 10. Guaranteed. So it's actually not too different from the mean value theorem for derivatives. And our goal right now is to find that point. So it's a little bit beyond doing average value. It's find the average value, set it equal to f of c, solve for c. So let's try it. Now we already did av f for sine x yesterday between 0 and pi. Do you remember yesterday we did it um, and we got that the average value of sine of x on 0 to pi, your answer should be right there at the top of your page. Wasn't it just 2 over pi? Look on your paper there. Didn't we do that example yesterday? Okay. So now, we have, now I'm interested in setting this equal to f of c. Okay. So I'm going to take f of c, in other words, sine c, and set it equal to 2 over pi. Now for this I'm going to need a calculator because I plan to do inverse sine of 2 over pi and I can definitely not do that in my head. So what is the inverse sine of 2 over pi? Make sure your calculator is in radian mode, right? What'd you get? Uh, I'll type it myself. Okay, so 
I heard someone shout point two something. Let's see. Sine inverse of 2 over pi is 0 0.6901. Nice guess. Whoever was guessing. Okay. 0 0.6901 is the magic x value, and the y coordinate is 2 over pi. 0.6366. Okay, so let me just draw a picture of what just happened. We're talking about the first wave of the sine or the first bump of the sine wave. We're talking about this piece, right? The max on here is, of course, 1. We figured out yesterday that 0 0.6366 is the average value. It's 2 over pi. And we believe that there is a point somewhere along this curve that has that as the y value. Sure enough, it's this guy. This guy, point A, lives at 0 0.6901, 0 0.6366. I just don't believe he's the only one. Do you? I think there's another guy over here. Does anyone know how to find him? Remember that when you're studying inverse signs, you've got to be really careful not to assume there's one answer, OK? So like, when you're doing an inverse yourself, you know, sine c is 2 over pi, that always is more than one answer. Okay, so what you're supposed to do is after you isolate C, you're then supposed to look at the supplementary angle. Okay, so let me just remind you why. Um, can you think of two angles on the unit circle whose sine there is a half? Sine is a half. Can you think of which angles those are on the unit circle? Wasn't there one right here at pi over 6? And then wasn't there one over here at 5 pi over 6? The y coordinate was a half for both of these. This is a parenthesis. Right? The x's are different, but at pi over 6 and at 5 pi over 6, we have the same y coordinate, right? So they both have sine and a half. So, in other words, pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6, what's the relationship between those two numbers? Pi over 6, 5 pi over 6, what's the relationship? They add up to what? Not 1. They add up to pi. In other words, they're supplements. They add up to 180, see? So we believe that pi minus 0.6901 is also a valid answer. Okay, so we need to do that as an alternative answer. So um, anytime you do an inverse sign, you're also supposed to jot down the supplement. Or pi minus 0.6901. And that gives us, except I just can't type today, pi minus 0.6901 is 2.452. So 2.452 is the other answer. Point B, let's call it. Point B is 2.452 comma 6.366. Okay, let's go on to the next one. In this next problem, we're doing the same thing, only this time it's a different graph, different interval, same idea. Okay, so we already did the average value. What is the average value of 4x minus x squared on the interval 1 to 3? We did it up above in your notes. So what was the answer? 11 thirds, that's right. So I'm going to take this function, 4x minus x squared, and I'm going to set it equal to 11 thirds. I believe there's a C value where 4C minus C squared is 11 thirds. There might even be more than one answer. I believe the function can actually equal 11 thirds. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and have to solve this. I think I'm going to use like the quadratic formula here probably. So let's multiply by 3. We get 12C minus C squared equals 11. In other words, C squared equals, I'm sorry, c squared, um, what am I doing? Minus 12c plus 11 equals 0. 3c three squared. Three squared. I forgot my tripling there. Thank you. I need the quadratic formula, unless I feel like trying to factor it, which I really don't. I don't think it really factors anyway. So let's just get, get that going. Actually, does it factor? 
I don't know. Let's just do the quadratic formula. So x equals, or in this case, c equals, 12 plus or minus the square root of 144 minus, and then it's 4 times 3 times 11, all over 6. Those of you who have the quadratic formula programmed in your calculator will be grateful for that. So 12 plus 144 minus 12 times 11 divided by 6. That gives me 2.5774. We'll just round it to 2.577. And then if we go with the minus solution, we get 1.4226. two answers. Again, sometimes we get two answers, sometimes we get one answer, just kind of depends on the curve itself. Okay, and then for a third example, let's do the same thing with our third example from above. So, I'm going to basically set 3 minus square root of 4 minus c squared equal to the average value. Do you remember what we got for an average value on this semicircle problem up above? 0.429. Can you give me the exact answer? No, it was uh, like 12 minus pi or something. Oh, 12 minus the Maybe you don't have it written down. That's okay. We can do, was it 1.429? Okay, just know that you need a little more accuracy than that on the AP test because you're going to be rounding your final answer to three digits, not, you know, not halfway through your work. So anyway, we'll go ahead and run it. Uh, I need to subtract three from both sides. Okay, and this leads me to square root of 4 minus c squared is equal to 1.5710. Then I need to square both sides. So 4 minus c squared equals 2.4680. Then I need to basically do 4 minus that and add the c squared to the other side and square root. Okay, the answer is plus or minus 1.238. And all of these have the same meaning. These are the x coordinates of the points that live on the average. If ever there was an average run of the middle point on the curve, these are them. They are the average value, nothing above, nothing below. They're right on the average. Okay? So that's my notes for today. And so that you can try some of those in the book, I'll assign them to you now.